we're back. Back in the backyard. This is... Welcome to... Let me get this right. Yeah. Welcome. <laughs> it's been a long day, man. It sure has. And hot, too. Yeah. For, for, for Buffalo? Yeah. Mm. It's not Georgia, but... So anyway, welcome to Smart to Noise Ratio, Pro Audio Podcast. This is number 15, everybody. Mm-hmm. Or wait, was the last one number 15? Yeah, it's 16. You haven't heard 15 yet, as we're recording this. Oh, I misnamed it. Oh, well. Anyway, welcome to 16. We're creeping on 20. That's pretty exciting. Not really, but whatever. We're it's close to the number one, so it's got just, something going. Tonight is just the two sarcastic ones. Mm-hmm. Well, actually, no, I guess Carl's probably, he's probably the leader, but yeah. we, have, we haven't got anybody to mellow us out tonight, so we may, <laughs> we're going to try. We picked a topic. Amanda, Amanda might stop out. She mm-hmm. might can some stuff. It should be good. So we, we picked a topic that's more difficult than others to get snarky about. We're going to talk about bus compression. We actually had a, a request from our friend Blake. He hit us up on Facebook. Yay! Yeah. So we'll take care of a little bit of that before we get going. My um, downfall. If you have stumbled onto us uh, on YouTube, searching Pro Audio or some such thing, uh, you may not know about the blog that we write. That can be found at Smart, the number two noise. That's smarttonoise.blogspot.com. Check that out. Or uh, if you have a problem remembering that, actually, it's it should be emblazoned across the screen. If yeah, I, I think that's the only thing that's on the screen, isn't it? If I remember to do that. Well, it's the, the name of the... The thing, but yeah, oh, okay. I, I usually as an tag it yeah, I yeah. tag it. Um, but, although you can't link to it, which is weird. But That's whatever. yeah. Um, so that, uh, or you can locate us. Uh, we've got a page on Facebook, we've got a page on Google Plus, and we are on Twitter. Uh, so dig us up one way or another. If you got some commentary, if you got some questions you'd like answered, if you'd like to be on the show, we'd love to have you. Uh, we can even Skype you in if you were from far away. So uh, let's see here. What other recent developments? Uh, we have heard back from uh, our new friend in Germany. Oh, we did? Yeah. I haven't heard about that. Uh, it just, uh, he and oh, I have okay. been exchanging a couple emails back and forth. Um, it appears that he's sort of about the same sized small dog as, as most of us are, working the day job, doing a few gigs on the weekends. So uh, I thought it might be an interesting podcast to get him on, at least for a little bit, and uh, just see what's the same and what's different for a guy doing what we do, but over in Deutschland. Uh, Killing himself on 220, 240, whatever. <laughs> I bet he's over there. <laughs> um, so that's that. Uh, and I'm not going to bore anybody with the other statistics, but uh, we're looking for if you, <laughs> if you have any friends in North or South Dakota or in Wyoming, not Wyoming, Montana. Oh, wow. Those are the three states that we don't, we haven't if had. you know any cows I know. that have. And it's funny because one of the other <laughs> podcasts that we listen to, the guy's kind of a, a metrics freak mm. and so he's, he's always digging into his data and in north and south dakota were the holdouts for him for a long time too i mean they had many many more listeners and followers than than we currently do and he was still lacking so apparently there's not a lot of entertainment well, going what, what we need to do is make a biker podcast and then we'll get all of sturgis yeah we need to work sturgis <laughs> Let's get after that. We, yeah. Let's, let's stop trying to court all these. My, I think my BS. uncle, my uncle knows some people that yeah. own the strip club and <laughs> biked for lots of other. Go on. <laughs> before before <laughs> I get into stuff that before you go down that road get, too far, get in federal prison for yeah. So at any rate, um, when people hit us up online, we want to encourage that. So my buddy Blake uh, dropped us a line on Facebook, which is weird because you could have just texted us, but. Um, <laughs> Tagged up on a post and I uh, just was just curious about compression and I should have looked up the post so I could quote it exactly but it was something along the lines of how do you use compression on the subs on the groups when you're mixing live and what should you and should you not compress and I think the answer well, is um, well you should compress everything yeah I mean I feel we, like we were both against it for a while but honestly a, a nice if you got a desk that'll do it. Throwing just a touch on the mains really does help you a bit. If you got the extra channels to spare, like I, I know I didn't do it for a long time, and I, in my day job, I still don't do it because we don't have. It's, it's. I, I don't know the 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 word that I'm looking for right now, but it's it's a desk, um, <laughs> and it it puts sound out, but it's that's about it. Um, not, <laughs> not good sound. Um, but it it doesn't have uh, main inserts on it, so we can't actually compress the whole system without. Uh, well, we could, but not easily. So it, it's something that I would like to do. You can't get that in the driver rack. 
I'm going to do it a touch on the drive rack, but it, it starts getting, it, like, we don't have the real nice, like, the 4, 480, I think, the, the, the few thousand dollars. we got the 260, so that's, it's about a grand, and it'll do it, it just, I'm not a huge way of the fan, it's, or I'm not a huge fan of the way it sounds. It, it'll work, but it's not pleasurable to listen to. I, I actually like a, a lot of DBX stuff, but I don't like drive racks, and it's a shame, because everybody's got one, and it was funny, because I didn't, I didn't learn how to drive one. They had been around for about 10 years mm -hmm. before I was, before I learned how to drive one, so I was like, what, really? I was like, well, I don't own one, because I went a different direction for system processing, and like, here's how it goes. You walk into a place, what do you got for the system? Drive rack. Can I touch it? No. So that was right. how it went yeah, for 10 and years. That's, because no one, like, you, you hire a company, Carl, <clears throat> And, no, I don't know if Carl does or not, but you hire a, a pro audio company to come in and install some stuff for you, and usually nine times out of ten, at least in my experience, first thing they say is, well, you need a drive rack. And that's industry standard terminology. They, you know, it's, it is a drive rack. They throw in there, and they'll tune it, and you have no idea what the hell is going on with it. Unless you know what you're doing. Right. Which, yeah. um, you know, the, the guys on this podcast are sort of the, the rare exception. There are a lot of guys out there applying our craft who have no business touching a drive rack, and that's what that's, that answer is right. crafted for. And it's not a bad thing. Like a lot of times, you got if you got a good system tech that'll that'll put it in and tune it the right way, um, it's not a bad thing. But the problem that I've run into personally with mine is that I knew what it did, um, but I was used to other processors, so I didn't expect that. Uh, uh, one of my my buddies, Bill, who is um, I wish he was listening. I would love to get him in on some stuff. His name's Bill Alexander. Bill is a ungodly organ player. He plays a Hammond like it's nobody's business. But Bill doesn't have five fingers on each hand. Um, Bill has a, a birth defect that he was born with, but he still has one of the best ears and best approaches to processing and running front of house of anyone I've ever met. Um, and he he informed me that dry racks have a battery that I didn't know about. I figured, hey, you run on AC all the time, you plug in your ferment, it's good. But there's a battery that stores all of your information, and when the battery starts going or is gone, the dry rack still remembers everything, but not as well. So you'll actually hear a 3 to 6 dB uh, increase or decrease in your volume at any given time because... It's not necessarily working too hard, but just doesn't have the brain to remember all that stuff without the battery. Huh. So I like, didn't use a non-volatile method for that. It's kind right. Of yeah. Well, the, what he told me is with drive racks when they engineered, because he actually talked to the guys at DBX that built them. He said that what they were meant to do is meant to do a show, get locked up in a rack somewhere, go to the next show, and that's fine. And it's not a big deal because essentially you're resetting everything every show. Mm -hmm. But if you hold the same settings for years, like I have, like the system that I'm working on right now was installed, I think, in 2002 or 2003 when I was still in middle school um, to date myself a lot and make me feel insignificant in years again. Um, but uh, he told me, it's like, that's, they're meant to change every show. It's not meant to hold the same the same charge and the same amount of data as uh, as everything else. So if it's changing every show, it's not a big deal. But if you're holding the same settings for literally a decade, it uh, it starts to get on you a little bit. So what we did is he, uh, I, I hadn't thought about it. I knew you could plug it in. But what I didn't know was uh, that if you didn't change the battery frequently and it like every year or so just to be safe, especially we use it, I want to say four or five times a week. Um, if you don't change it, it starts it starts creeping on you. Hmm. So that was one of the problems that we had at a, a conference that we did where he noticed really bad and, like, he really had to stay on stuff to make sure. But he, he downloaded settings on his laptop and sent them to me, and I've just been lazy because there's a certain type of interface. You have to plug it into a RS-232 plug, I believe, on the back, which is like a VGA plug. Um drop that into a USB port, which has to be a non-modem USB port, otherwise it doesn't play nice, and then plug it into your computer. So if you don't have all those right components, which ended up costing me like 50 bucks at the end of the day, um, you can't back up your settings, take the, the drive rack out, change the battery, and then go back and reload stuff. 
So what I've been stuck with is I have the settings, but I don't have the non-modem USB port anymore because my video guy took it away and won't answer my phone calls. Uh, so time that, to get an Ashley, right? Yeah, time to get an Ashley because <laughs> they're they don't approve purchase orders for drum heads. So yeah. <laughs> anyway, so uh, we we kind of diverged from the topic a little bit, but that is an interesting point. Um, and I want to before we you know compression on the two mix is uh, that's where we'll go next, but. Um, interesting point there because I'm from the exact opposite world where I touch my system processor every single time I go out and I except for some configuration settings like oh I'm um for how my speakers are configured if I'm you know left right sub or if I'm you know left, left right, right left right sub fill two two sets of subs delay towers you know I have settings like that saved but um and my crossover points but other things like uh, even though I play the same rooms, some of the same rooms with some regularity, um, I don't want to trust my settings. Like I don't want to necessarily trust the sound guy that I was two weeks ago or a month ago or a year ago when I walked in that room because that I mean that was the guy that I was then and that was the room that that was then. And so right. things are going to change. Temperature, yeah. humidity. You know, okay, you can, you can plug in those settings, but you know, I, w- I want it to be. I, I like to feel like I'm always getting better. And I want to improve on what I did last and time, not just pull it up again. There's no way to get better if you're start like our, um, when I played in the band that Carl plays in now. I remember him going into every room, and back then when I was playing, he was he was the system tech and engineer for everything, which was great because um, Carl's a fantastic engineer. Uh, but he would I don't know if he did every single time, but there are rooms that I remember playing twice a year every year, and he would literally start from scratch every time even though we had everything labeled and set, and maybe there was nothing different, but maybe your ears are a little bit different now. Maybe hopefully, they, hopefully you're better now. <laughs> right, exactly, yeah. Hopefully you've progressed in in your profession or your hobby or whatever it is uh, to know that things change, and maybe back then you didn't want to hear as much 6K, and maybe now you want to hear a little bit more or, or vice versa, but he would start from almost scratch every time because... It's it's not good to get comfortable in what you're doing. You don't learn anything that way. You don't get any better by going back to the same old standbys every single time and and mixing shows. Yep. And that was where I really hit a quantum leap with my skill and my craft was when I realized it, it used to take a long time to realize that I'd really fallen into a rut on something. And it would usually take some set of circumstances that forced me to do something different. Um, and as time went by, I got better at looking at things and thinking of things well how could I do this better like yeah this is working fine but is there something I could you know I'm I'm pouring over the gear that I'm using and seeing if there's features that I don't know Um, and maybe you won't ever use them like maybe there'll just be some features in a box that you won't ever use but if they're there and you know about them one if you need them you can pull them up and two if you if you think of a way that might be better you can try it yeah like it it doesn't ever hurt if you've got enough time for loading and sound check and all that stuff I mean mess around with your stuff if you've got features that you're not using Maybe it's because you don't know them already, or maybe it's because you haven't had a chance to try them out. If it's something that might possibly be able to help you, or even if not, like it, it doesn't ever hurt to know your gear as well as you possibly can. Yep. And what's nice too is like once you shorten up that cycle, you know, it would, it's not to say that you need to be doing things wildly different every time. You know, even if it's a, a slow process of mutation for you because of the situation that you're in. Um, you know, it's like a soloist on an instrument. You know, if you ask any of the great, you know, the people, I mean, great people known for improvisation, yep. they'll tell you they're just stringing together tricks. You know, they have yep. a fantastic memory for stuff that they've worked on. I, I watched a great video today of uh, somebody was a very clever individual, and uh, I couldn't find a Victor Wooten bass technique video that I was looking for for a while. And somebody actually set up a camcorder in front of their TV and played on VHS a Victor Wooten uh, a bass demo or a bass technique video from 1992. And, you know, he hit play and you saw the little tape, like the, the old bars. VHS icon show up on the screen, play and all that stuff. But he was saying, he's like, you know, it's I play the bass. I played the bass since I was, however, probably four years old. And uh, he used to play and uh, he did dinner music for this, this nice posh little club or a vegan restaurant or something like that in Nashville. And it's dinner music. People don't really pay attention to what you're playing, but he's like, I would practice. I would try different things. And 
the most important thing is to make it sound musical, and that translates not from just playing an instrument, but to mixing the sound too. You need to work on, you know, if you don't play an instrument, you don't, you don't get that side of it. That's fine, but you mixing a show is just as musical as people playing it. If you're gonna make it sound like it's in a tin can, you're not gonna get anywhere. But if you're constantly trying to to work on making yourself better and, and trying new techniques that, you know, maybe it doesn't sound great this time, but next time it'll sound fantastic because you know what you're doing. It's 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 a place that until the big bucks hit, you got a chance to try stuff out and take chances and and really expand what you know by messing around with what you've got. And by mixing musically, that's something that was a concept that took me a long time to grasp, and I think a lot of guys in our business don't ever grasp it. At least from or, what you hear. or don't want to grasp it. Right. They feel like they're above it. But to, to kind of describe that a little bit, and we will get to bus compression eventually. Don't sit tight, Blake. We'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the two of us. No one's keeping us on target right uh, now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I decided not to play study hall monitor today. Um, but thing, things in that realm are, like, are you going to make smooth transitions, or are you going to just pop a fader to where it's going? And, you know, like, oh, and yeah. are you going to do it in time with the music? Are you going to make your changes on the downbeat or right and are you going to time out your not just your delay effects but your reverbs too to the pace of yeah. the song like are, are you gonna like going back to this week we had a, a a pretty big we had almost 300 kids there every day which is good for a church our size for a kids camp every week and our kids pastor is phenomenal she like she made this giant superhero steam we had this bad guy called bomb voyage running around and stuff but in between the songs and stuff when they were transitioning you have to know when when to cut out your delay, and maybe leave the reverb going for a little bit because it really does fatten up the room. Um, having a, a nice touch of reverb on some of the vocals where they don't just stop as soon as they're done, because you've got a mood that you're trying to set. You want a nice feel of ambience and stuff. That what I found is leaving a touch of reverb on the vocals in between songs when they're maybe changing guitars or just transitioning keys, anything like that. It adds to the whole. It adds to a show, and that. Like that's a nice kind of Pink Floyd reference to yeah. make everything kind of work together and, and a whole show to flow as a show, not as a set of songs. Yep, and that stuff is work. Um, another example, too, is like if you've got a vocalist, like I, I had one on stage this weekend um, who is, he gets right on the mic when he's singing soft, which is good because it helps him stay closer. He sort of compresses himself. He knows he sings quieter when he sings in his lower octave, and so he gets right up on the mic. Yep. But his his voice is lower, mm -hmm. and you get the proximity effect from the microphone. So yep. I know when he comes to a, a certain section of a song, if he's singing, you know, low in volume and in his lower register, I need to reach up and roll 180 back, two, three, four dB. Or he starts blending in with all right. the bass stuff. And, and, and I also have to decide to do that or not. Sometimes I don't do it, but I don't do it on purpose because it, you know I, I want his vocal to be really fat and loud there. Actually, uh, and and that's work. Like you have to, you know. Okay, you could say, all right, if I was rich, I would I would get a dynamic EQ and I would put it on his voice, or I would use some multiband compression to automate that process. But then, you that, know, that takes away from your job. Like you got to look at it like that. That is your job, unless you're doing it for free because you're a really good guy. That's that's what's making you money to feed your family. Well, that's I mean, that's where we're at. If we're gonna have a show where we're not going to take the time to do stuff, people aren't going to call us back, and that means that I can't have bacon Mondays anymore, and that's a problem for me, <laughs> being a Jew, <laughs> eating bacon. <laughs> ah, two podcasts in a row. Uh, I'm just waiting to hear from some fraternal organization of Jewish brethren coming down on us. For Asking us to stop, <laughs> or I'm not allowed on the podcast anymore. <laughs> Although, as sound guys, it's really our job to sit in the back and make snarky comments about stuff, so that, I mean, that's just part of behind the scenes. Well, you got to remember that you actually have a job to do other than make, other than making snarky comments and, and back-talking people. <laughs> that's I'm working on that yeah. a lot. Uh, something else, too, that's that's in that musical thing is uh, I was going through a, a, you know, a line check, sound check tonight, working with my band. Um, we had a rehearsal Wednesday, so the monitor mixes were all pretty well set. I knew what everybody's instruments were going to sound like. But a couple of days have gone by. Some things have changed. People's metabolisms have changed. Things are coming out. You humidity, know, tiny, humidity in the room is different. Yep, tiny bit different. So, you know, we always go through it. And uh, what my young interns was standing right behind me 
And he's like, ooh, that vocal's bassy. I was like, oh, yeah, he's, he's singing low and close, and I'm not going to do it now, but you know, when he does that, I'm going to fix it. Mm. And he said, oh, that guitar, man, shouldn't you put some bottom back in that guitar? I was like, well, it sounds too thin now, but when you hear it with the other acoustic guitar and the electric and the organ and the right. thing and the thing and the thing and the thing, it is what it needs to be to fit in the mix and to not have a muddy mix. Yep. So it's... Uh, anyway, those are just a few tips on, on what you can do to start thinking musically. And uh, another thing, too, is play an instrument, man. And even more importantly than that, get in a band if you can. If you've never had that experience, um, I, th- that's what really formed my whole... I mean, I've been on a, a 15-year quest to become the, the best monitor mixer that I can, whether I'm doing it from the side stage or front of house. And you're damn good at it. And, and I, I really well, I appreciate playing, you saying that more than you know. Playing, playing in a band that you've mixed monitors for, it's... It, it wasn't work at all. Like it was, it was nice to have someone that actually cared and put the time and effort into figuring out what you needed in your ears or in your wedge. And it's not to say that you couldn't get to where you could do a good job at that, but it helps to sort of have some skin in the game, I guess is yeah. the way to put it. Is I've been on stage. When I was young and I had nothing to invest but my time, we were in a band, and we jammed four or five hours a day, every day, just for the joy of playing music. Oh, I missed that. But we had junk for equipment. We'd play yeah. gigs out. I mean... The lead singer got a monitor, and if anybody else got one, it was your birthday. <laughs> uh, and so, like, I felt that frustration. And you of, wore the outfit to, to match. Yeah. <laughs> so I felt that frustration of, of being on stage and just feeling lost and not being able to, to catch where something else is going on. Um, so, like, I, I don't know. I, just, I, I think it really helps you identify that feeling. And I don't, I don't ever want one of my musicians, even if it's somebody I've never met on a, and it's on a festival stage and I'm, I'm not going to see him ever in my life after the hour that we have together. But I, I just feel like I owe it to them to, to not let them have that feeling. And the other thing too, um, you know, playing, playing an instrument in the high school band is kind of one thing. I mean, that can give you some musical sensibility to where you understand keys and moods and, and how sections work together, whether it's the sections of a brass band or a string band or a rock band. Um, I don't know, there's, there's something about playing in a, in a rock type band or jazz type band or blues band um, where it's a small group and you're, and you're jamming, you know, like yeah. you, you get so that you, you direct each other with your eyes. You know, like yep. you'll hear, uh, you know, especially in blues bands, it's really common. It's, you know, it's, uh, bring it around again. Right. A really or, good or band turn can turn it around again. Yeah, a really good oh, band God. can do that. I mean, without even looking at each other. I mean, they can they can tell just by what's being played and, and motions and a shrug of the shoulder or a crook of the knee. I mean, the yep. the, the weirdest thing. And the the really good guys just do it all the time. Like that that one glorious Olympic medal winning moment that I got to play <laughs> got to play with Teaspoon. Like you just you'd see him move a different way. You're like, oh, oh, he's I, going. I got that. Yeah, I know where. I know what you're. Yep. Uh uh-huh. Yeah. Yep. And that like that makes a whole lot of difference, and especially mixing. Like I, I know. I mean, we're usually about fifty to one hundred yards away, depending on the show venue. But if you see, you know, especially if you work with people for a while, and if they're they're good, like I I've never played with a better drummer than Spoon, and I need to talk to him soon. I guess this but, turned into the Mixing Musically podcast, and that's right. cool. I, we'll get to compression. We'll get, yeah, we'll get there. But uh, we got time. that's another thing, too. And uh, Dave Ratt is huge on this. He actually sets up his front of house position, so his console's to the side, his dynamic rack's in front of him, and he's and the, looking over that at the band, and he makes everything as dark as possible, doesn't label his console, knows every knob and fader and switch by feel. Yep. And that's, you know, you maybe don't need to go to that extreme, but, like, you need to know your gear well yep. so that you can take a quick look at it, you know, sweep your eyes over it like a, an airline pilot, and know, you know, like, oh, that switch got bumped. Oh, that LED's yep. not lit. Something's up. And or, you know, this yeah. meter isn't in the, isn't where I expect it to be. And that, even, and, even working with, like, the, the going back to the kids' camp thing, like, it, we didn't have a light on our console. It was a little Yamaha 20, or I'm sorry, 32 channel with built-in effects and stuff. It actually didn't sound too bad for built-in effects, but um, by by the end of the by the end of the week, I knew that I knew my hand was going to be my left hand was going to be pinky on the bass, uh, middle finger. I'm sorry, ring finger, lead electric, second or middle finger on uh, second electric keys, and then my right hand was on the vocals. And once I got the vocals mixed nice, I moved my right hand over to bus section. And, and working totally in the dark and just just knowing watching the stage and knowing when my hands were planted 
Um, I worked with these guys for a few years now, but knowing where your hands are planted and knowing what needs to happen, like, yeah, you've got to mess with some EQ every once in a while, and maybe there's a, a guitar part that needs a little more beef or a little bit less beef. Um, yeah, I call it mixing in Braille, to where you just, it, you, yeah. you might need a quick glance, you but, know, so you don't type an A instead of an S, you know, like that guy, right, it's yeah. like touch typing, to where you just, you can watch the band and, and, and get from seeing what they're doing, know where they're going, and that, you know, this even matters even if you're working for the same band and they're playing the same thing every night, like. I wish Carl was around for that, because he's got. He's got some great tour, tour, great tour, tour stories. stories about Catch. But, uh, you know, if something goes wrong, if something's not right, you can see it compensate for it. I have a great little quick story. We were doing a, a festival stage, uh, basically a beer tank. But there was a band that we'd worked for periodically, but not real often. So, like, they really, they may as well have been strangers. Like, we knew them right. a little bit, but we hadn't seen their show in a year. New drummer, different setups and things. And uh, so it was basically a new band to us. Anyway, end of the night comes, and they're getting ready to wrap up. And I lean over to the lighting guy. I go, they're going to do seven big hits. And he didn't catch it. Like, he, like, he didn't either. He, he got on the offbeat of six of them. Well, he even couldn't quite hear what I say. Or, like, he, did, he just didn't have time to get his fingers in place to, like, really make, you know, bam, 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 bam. And after they finished and wrapped up and we muted everything, he looked over at me and goes, how did you know that? I'm like, I saw the singer throw the drummer a single. Yeah. And that's, yep. you know, just one little thing. Like, we don't know these guys. We don't have a choreographed light show based on every every beat of their set. Yeah, but we, not... we could have made, if we right. had made that connection, you know, made it look like the show was one big cohesive thing and and that that helps a lot with that whole musician versus sound guy stereotype mm -hmm. like if, if you help them they'll help you all right bus compression bus compression that's <laughs> enough on mixing musically oh that's something i mean we could we should definitely bring that up with carl yeah, around absolutely. oh yeah the, the last thing i was going to say on that was um and i've read this and heard this actually quite a few times recently um Play, pick up an instrument and play. If you don't play now, I, I feel like you're really missing out. Um, you know, and that's uh, sound guys that don't play. I just, I really feel like they should. I mean, buy a cheap acoustic guitar, even if you don't want to pay for lessons. Like, go on Craigslist. They're fifty bucks. Right. There's plenty one. of stuff online. Piano, guitar, even violin. Uh, it's something. Pick up an instrument, learn how to play it, and, and get so that you you start to understand the soul of the musician a little bit and understand music a little better, and and your mixes will take off guaranteed yep. there's i mean that's that's it's work like everything else but if you really want to do this well you gotta you gotta put the work in yep. invest your time it's it's the only thing you've got sometimes so moving on to bus compression let's start with the two mix um yep. being a live guy apart from having limiters on my mains and actually limiters on my limiters on my mains for a lot of years <laughs> i didn't i never ever compressed the two mix um i was you know i would treat other things individually kick, snare, bass vocals. a little bit, vocals definitely, um, and I would do that on the subs, so we're getting there, we're inching, but uh, I had this band one time, and I found out why, it was because the guitar player is a mastering engineer, he says, hey, uh, we get done with sound check, he goes, how's it sound, I'm like, oh, dude, it's, it's great, you guys are awesome, he goes, do me a favor, throw a little compression on the two mix, give me like three to one, and get it so it's hitting like 10 dB on the big hits, and I was like, uh... Yeah, whatever. <laughs> and I, you know, I did it because you know they're the client. Yeah. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't snippy to them, but in my head, I'm like, really? Why like, are huh? you? Yeah. Um, and at the time, I wasn't really sure it did any good, but um, I've gotten so I do it more and more. Like whether I, whether it's that I'm inching into my limiters a bit and getting two or three dB of reduction, um, compression just sounds good. I mean, you you don't want to make it like dance music or like a CD or something where you've totally where flattened it out. it sounds like it's just squeezing down every downbeat. But, because that's the exciting thing about live music is that there's so much dynamic range. Right. I mean, that's why orchestras are so exciting. Like, rock concerts are loud, but orchestra concerts have way more oh dynamic gosh. range. They're just, they're more, they're almost more interesting to listen to, whether or not you like the music. I, I particularly am not a huge fan of it, but on an individual level, knowing that there are a hundred people that are doing exactly what an electronic unit would do to them by themselves and then just give them that little push over the hump to really make a pop. Yep, and that some guy in the 1500s made that happen in his head and then made it happen on paper. And yeah. Somehow, I mean, that's, that's, just the, that's the glory of music. That's why this is exciting and why we do it. Um, but to, to put it another way, like to, you don't want to suck the life out of it. You don't want to make your performance flat. But taking off some of those the big peaks makes it it brings up the apparent level so you yep. can have things feel louder without actually being like eye squinting ear popping loud 
makes makes it more of a, a musical effect. Right. So that. you can you can get that big rock and roll sound without it being actually Bon Jovi loud in the room that you're in. Right. Um, and people people appreciate that. Like, it, it needs to feel loud, not be loud. Is the thing. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that gets you too is tightening up your dynamics on the other end. Um, this is how important dynamics are. If you put a hole in a song, and, and by dynamics we mean compression and. And gating things that affect the volume and the output yep. of and the total level. range of, of decibel levels coming out. Right. Um, if you put a hole in a song like the uh, what is it? The immigrant song. Yeah. Is that line? So now you better stop reaping all your All right. That a lot of bar bands do this trick. So now you better stop. Two, stop. three, four. They full stop. Yep. Not not you know, mute the cymbals. You know, mute everything. And you watch, and an audience will literally. Lean forward yep. like they're trying oh, yeah. not to fall off the bottom step of the stairs when that happens. They want to hear that hit, and that's and then they go nuts when the band comes back in. Or sometimes in the silence. I mean, I've seen them like oh, yeah. in a in a big beer tent at a at a big yeah. carnival or festival. Instead of holding it out for three, you hold it out for uh, for eight. Right, oh, and you yeah. know the, the three drunkest guys in the place start screaming, and <gasps> then by the time you're in yep. the second full measure of rest, the whole place is screaming. It's amazing, uh, and that's what classical composers understood was that dynamic range is exciting and bands that understand dynamic range make exciting music that's yep. why uh, like bands that don't get it like uh, some of these math metal bands are like the real blasty it's metal loud bands. from downbeat to end of song right right the the exciting stuff is the stuff that has dynamics there's ups and downs and you know verse two is the same as verse one but a little different and, and that's you know, why motown it's oh, so good yeah uh listen Listen to some Stanley Clark. Listen to some, uh, oh, oh, I was just, Marcus Miller. Like, any, any yeah, of those maybe. real, just, people that aren't white. <laughs> I don't know, like, that, that's what it comes down to. Like, white people seem to have this obscure version of, uh, of what they want to hear. They want it to be big and popping all the time, and, and that's fine. And you know what? I'll even, I'll even give props to the Beatles. For a second, I died. I probably just lost three years off my life doing that. Um, but coming down in the song doesn't mean you're not a rock band. It means that you understand the music. Like all that, you listen to some old, some old Motown, some old Beatles and stuff. Like there are points in the song where "Hey Jude" is not giant in the verses. It's very laid back. It it flows into what it is, and then that chorus hits. And it really pops, and that like that's what makes a song a song. It doesn't make it. The lyrics are great, like a lot of the old Bob Dylan stuff, where you know he'd be fiddling around on guitar or harmonica or whatever and singing. That was great, and then the chorus hit, and it really it was nothing fantastic music wise, just very basic chord structure, but it hit nice and it hit solid, and people wanted to listen to it. They were waiting, they were anticipating for that. And that anticipation, that that building of the dynamic range is what makes people want to come back to a live show. Mm-hmm. And uh, to get back on bus compression... <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah, bus compression. One of the things that you need to be careful of, um, and not that you don't want to do this, maybe you do want to do this, but, but whatever the loudest thing is, whatever's peaking, which is usually the kick drum, might be the bass, but it could also snare. be the vocals. Snare can do it. Um, what you, The loudest element can basically wind up driving the bus that is the compressor. So if you're if you're using bus compression, which is right? Well and you, so you want to be careful of your attack times and your release times. And there's really not a formula. You just, you need to feel it. Like if you want the kick drum to drive the mix and make the mix pump, yep. you can actually lower the volume, raise the apparent loudness, mm-hmm. and then raise it more by having the kick and the snare drive it. So like you feel like you're just getting these big one-two punches, like haymakers, like boom, bop, boom, bop. And especially in, in parts where it comes down going back to kids camp again because that's my most recent experience like there are parts in the song where everything else comes out and it's just kick drum just quarters right down the center um and maybe i don't want that as loud in the mix as everything else while the whole song's going while the whole band's going but maybe while it's just that i want to i want to bump it up three or six dbs to really make people feel where the song's going because there's nothing else going on there's no guitar volume there's no bass volume there's one vocal singing maybe two um but the kick drum is what's driving it and that's if it if the whole dynamic of the song comes down but the kick drum is what's driving it then push the kick drum a little bit mm-hmm. or you got those big giant you know motley crew kick snare kick snare hits mm-hmm. um 
If that's what's coming through, then make it come through. It doesn't need to come through in the whole song, most of the time at least. But if that's what's coming through, keep your finger, you know, learn the song during sound check. Know that you're going to want to push that kick drum up a touch to make the, the song really pop. So uh, if you don't understand what we're saying when we talk about uh, a kick drum driving the compressor or making it pump, uh, go look that up. I don't, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but um, this is another reason why bass management has become so important. That's yeah. just because, you know, we need more and more bass. Bass, is, bass and treble are really like a drug. Mm-hmm. This is why things like oral exciters, I wish they didn't exist anymore, because it's just, it's ear candy. It really and is. And it is like a drug, because you turn it up and people go, oh yeah, that's better, the high sound, awesome. In two minutes, their ears are dead to it, and they right. want more. Yeah, and that's... It's like, rinse and repeat yeah. until blood is coming out of people's ears. If, that, if, if that's something you, like, there was a, a band that I, I worked with um, that opened for my friend Joey's band, that he had an oral exciter actually in his rack mount for his, oh. his SVT, but he knew how to work it. He didn't just play full on all the time. Like there were points in the song where he would dig in a touch more uh-huh. when it was just him. Maybe, maybe a transition in between where the bass really needed to come through, and it came through. He left it on all the time, but when he wasn't digging into it, when he knew the dynamic of the song, it. Oh my gosh! And what uh, oral excited? Uh, there's so many different flavors of them now that uh, different companies make was, products with basically the same idea. And there's right. there's high and there's low. Like there's a units to do both. They have a subharmonic synth which is cool, and then this exciter section, which is really not cool unless you really understand it and know how to use it. The problem is nobody has ever understood these things, and I just... Like, it's just a more knob is this, what it is. Yeah, I've been at this for 20 years, and I, like, two weeks ago, found out what they actually do. They, uh, what it is, it, it dates back from the tape days, mm-hmm. and it was really hard to get high-end on cassette. Not, not on, we're not talking, like, two-inch studio like tape. Eight-track cassette type stuff. We're talking about mass-market ca- ca- tape. Um, it was really tough to get the highs on there. So what the exciter would do is uh, add high emphasis. Add you know it's like a dynamic EQ that pumped the highs based on what the mids were doing. It, so if the mids were coming on really strong, just it a would, shelf filter pretty much. Uh, nah, it's Ish. more it's more complex than okay. that. There's actually some compansion going on in there. Okay. It's compression and expansion same at the same time. Mm-hmm. Um, but what it would do is like raise the raise the noise floor. Lower the noise floor, rather, and the highs, which is always a problem on tape because the yeah. hiss and whatever. Yeah. Um, I like that hiss, though. But it would, like it's you know, well. what would happen is, like, the mids would load up and suddenly you couldn't hear your hi-hats anymore. And mm-hmm. the oral exciter would, would boost the highs up for you when the mids loaded up. Um, in the digital age, it's an abomination. It's the, the knob may have, instead of being labeled like more, it should be labeled ear fatigue in, in, <laughs> and lit. Like, it should be a lit sign that says ear fatigue. Well, we call that dubstep now. Yeah. Go on. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, so anyway, back to bass management. Uh, this is a, another great reason to go with an aux fed sub. If you don't get the concept, look it up and figure out how to do it. I don't care if it's a pain. Uh, Gordon and I go back and forth on this. He feels like having having high pass or yeah high pass filters high on pass every on channel it, yeah. is enough. But you don't get your what your what the bass you're feeding to your subs is dependent on your fader level. And maybe I don't want Unity bass going oh, to the right. subs. Yeah. When my, you know, I'm your guitar tracks. Well, even, okay, even, even, if, even if you've high passed them, like on my bass, like on my kick in my bass, like maybe I'm at a point in the night or maybe I'm in a room where I want to be able to turn the kick drum up really hot, but I want the top side of that and I want the subs to not overload a room mode or something like that. So, like having an AUGS knob that you can tweak for that. Um, it's really worthwhile doing. It's, hey, you, I keep saying, once you try it, you'll never go back. And, and, and Gordon insists that he is going back. So we'll, we'll continue to have that. He that, hasn't tried it enough. We'll, we'll continue to have that that discussion. Um, Take that, Gordon. Oh, it's nothing like that. All right. <laughs> I know. All right. um, so anyway, if, if your base is properly managed, if you have no information below 80 or 100 or 120 going to the compressor that's operating on your 2-mix, then... You could still make the kick drum pump, but it's not going to be because you've overemphasized 60 hertz or whatever. It's going to be because you right. know, the, the clap and the body of the, of the drum are doing it. Um, so anyway, I don't know if we've, we've made just a complete... Bus compression. Made a complete hash <laughs> of bus compression. Basically, I think the short lesson is if you are capable of throwing a compressor, a compressor across your two mix, whether it's throwing it on the inserts or using one in your system processing and having said that like I find the one in the in the DBX drive back units to be 
It doesn't. It's twitchy. Sound that great? It, yeah, it's twitchy. I, I feel like it it reacts too fast or something. And it, it, yeah, like it's got that over easy. I think it's got the over easy function, or at least the rest of my DDX stuff does. Where a lot of times I'll turn it off. Where on vocals, sometimes I'll leave it on because yeah, there there's sometimes that maybe you want a little bit more drive on on the edge of it on the attack, but a lot of times with with putting the over easy on, you you lose the actual function of the compressor, you lose what you want it to be doing. And, well, it, and it, it slows it, it down, yeah. Right, yeah. So, yeah, if you need a fast attack, you should you should be turning over easy off. Right. And, um, and that helps a lot with, especially snare mic. Like, and what over easy does, by way of explanation, is yep. it's uh, uh, higher-end compressors and plug-in compressors will have a, a set of knobs you can turn to adjust, the, or one knob, rather, to adjust what's called the knee yeah, of the compressor. Point. And if you're yeah. looking at the graph, you know, once you get that threshold point, that graph makes a kink, and then right. things are compressed from there on out. And the knee allows you to make that transition smoother, so it's not like, oh, oh now we're compressing. Um, it's useful for when you need a ton of compression, like um, like on a kick drum, for example, or on a, a smooth vocal, but that has a lot of dynamic range. You don't want it to, like, all of a sudden, you're like, oh, we're compressing. Uh, yep. You don't want it to be audible, so you, you kick that knee in or you turn that knee up. Or the release time, like if you don't have that, turn the release time up a bit. Or, I'm sorry, the attack time up a bit. Yeah, make it longer so it engages a little Smoother, later. yeah. Um, Got some big notes that you want to pull out. Yep. All right, so it's worth doing, but you kind of need to have your chops. Like, you really need to understand a compressor, and not just on paper. I mean, you need to be able to hear it. You need to get your ear used to being able to hear that, that dynamic change. And this is all stuff, like, the common listener isn't going to get this stuff. All they're going to know is if you get it right, it sounds better. Um, right. You're, you're going to be making changes. You're going to be able to hear things that other people can't hear and make changes that other people can't detect. And somehow your stuff is going to come out sounding better and, on the other side And that's, side of that. that's the way you want it, too. You'd rather not have the listener notice that, oh, they're compressing it at this volume when he makes this snare hit on a specific song or all that kind of stuff. You want it to sound smooth all the way across because that's, that's what will bring out the, the individual dynamics of the song. Yep. And like anything else, I mean, I, I don't feel like anything is set it and forget it. I mean, I say no. that sometimes. Oh, like, there, there are things that I don't touch there, for a long time, but... There are initial settings, like uh, like with snare or kick drum, like I'll usually set it two and a half to one just to be safe, but I'll only do it on one mic. So if I want, you know, more, like I'll usually only set it on the out mic uh-huh. just to catch some of that boominess. Um, I think when I was working with Joe, we had, we took your Joe Meek, we only had two channels of outboard compression that we were using to put on the lead vocal and the snare mic because, you know, there were a lot of little paradiddles that you wanted to catch, but at the same time, like, he, you know, Lines looked like and... a gorilla. Just be, <laughs> like, in, in Mike, his, actually, his little brother is an unbelievable drummer. I, I, I love playing with Mike, but it's it's something that he does for an effect, and it's not a bad thing at all. But at the same time, you want to be able to control that um, and not take away from the musicality of it. But it, let it let it drive what it needs to drive and not kill someone that it doesn't need to kill. <laughs> Stop the senseless killing. <laughs> so we're three quarters of the way through the show and we barely scratched the surface of bus <laughs> compression, which was really sort of a footnote. Uh, right. It, compression on the two mix for live is definitely an advanced topic and in the studio too. We should um, do a whole, if we can, work a whole podcast on two bus. You probably could because I mean I'm I'm listening to podcasts from heavy hitters in the industry who still don't really understand how compression behaves and what you what it should be doing on the two mix. So give it a try, but if you don't get it, don't feel bad because there are some big big dogs who are are fighting that same fight. Um, all right, so moving on to bus compression, which this is what uh, Blake was really asking was on the subgroups on a mixer. Um, what's the purpose? And we've talked about this before. I've written about it on the blog, uh, so look that up. But uh, for those of you who don't understand groups, this is it, it's a bit of a concept if you're new to audio. Normally, on a small mixer, on a simple mixer, or even on a big mixer, you, you're able to send every fader on the board just straight to left right, straight to the main mix out. If your console has groups... Wow, oh, the wind just really picked up. I hope you can still hear me over the trees. <laughs> Um, if your console has groups, what you can do then is lift that switch that sends your fader straight to the master output, make it take a detour through these submasters, and that's that's exactly what they're for. Like if you have a mix that has eight, ten, twelve channels of drums, and you want to raise or lower the drums as a group, you can grab a stereo pair of subs or even a single sub if you're mixing in mono, and 
move all of those faders together. Basically, you're not literally moving the faders, but you're 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 taking the sum of those drum faders and able to control that volume before it leaves the console. Um, and you you also have an opportunity to insert some processing there. Now, some guys don't. If you have the opportunity to mix it front of house where the monitor mixes and it all dependent on your gain structure or compression, then it's very easy to, to compress each individual channel. But if you are if you are mixing monitors from front of house, um, whatever compression you apply to the house mix, in most cases the musicians are going to hear that compression coming back in the wedges. Yep. Um, and that's not always a good thing. Some compression on a monitor mix is a good thing, too much. Uh, makes your vocalists work. It makes things hard to hear on stage. It raises the noise floor. It makes feedback more likely. Um, so uh, creates a whole lot of problems. Yeah, and compressing on the groups solves a lot of them. Yep. Um, I don't know how many bar shows, how many festival stages I've done on a four bus mixer with exactly four channels of compression. Been happy as a clam all day long. Now yep. it might mean mixing in mono so that you can have like a kick snare group, a rest of the kit group a guitar group and a vocal group, and then if you really need to compress the bass, you insert that on the channel, because right. there's usually not a lot of bass in the monitors and, anyway. And Dave Raz has a lot of stuff where he'll separate stuff out by kick snare, which is what essentially drives the music, and then blending in a whole kit sound and then a metals sound, which I, it, I like stu- that. Studio stuff is fantastic. Like, that's, you know, you, you, you do it off the sends, you run, you know, you got a whole, everything is run to the, uh, main out to the drum group so you get your whole drum level you sub mix that down but after that you got a kick drum or a, i'm sorry a kick snare uh subgroup a toms like what i like to do is kick snare um just to really drive the punch and stuff in the music um and then a toms group because with stuff that i'm working on right now especially my wife's stuff my, my lovely wife who's inside watching the olympics while we're out here jabbering about nerd <laughs> stuff um she this is, is how passionate we are about audio, that it tore us away <laughs> from the Olympics. I'm right? extremely passionate about and the Olympics. <laughs> Olympics and my wife. Um, but we've got a, like, I'll, I'll set up a Tom's group, too, where I want, maybe I want a different reverb sound on. I want a different room, uh, different gating techniques, different, uh, maybe, like, what, I, what I'm loving right now is the Macy Tapehead plug-in, um, which will, it adds, not, not distortion, but just a touch of drives of stuff, which really makes it come alive. So I want that on the kick and snare and maybe a touch on the toms where it'll make him come through and you can hear, you know, not an obnoxious amount of that 80s Phil Collins stuff, but enough where they pop and you really want to hear them come through on certain sections. And then on top of that, you do your metals group where you want different reverbs and different gating and different compression on your overheads and your ride cymbal and your uh, hi-hat cymbal. And if you got splashes and all that stuff, you've got the the money and the time to spend channels on that then you run it through something else but it, it once you mix all that down and put it back through the drum group it it makes the drum sound like something that you're really happy with yeah and, and compressing down the, the whole entire group of that after it's all been processed makes the drums sound more like a cohesive entire instrument instead of oh the kick sounds really good but that floor tom kind of sounds a little bit flabby or stuff like that and, uh, yeah, that's a, a technique that I like to use, too. Like, how you address the metals is pretty important. Um, when I'm bussing stuff, like, if I am just have four buses, I'll do a kick snare bus, a rest of the kit bus, and then I'll decide... Do you want to have a bass in the guitar's bus? No, no, no. No? I, I never bust the bass, unless I have an eight-bus console. Okay. But um, I'll decide whether or not to put the overheads in the rest of the kit bus if I want those mm-hmm. compressed. And with a heavy-handed drummer... Um, or a drummer that plays real life but just nails the cymbals or otherwise uh, backwards from that right um the the drum the tom hits can make the cymbals pump if you're yeah. careful oh, so yeah. that's it's an easy switch to make you just take it out of that group and put it back to the two mix um and then you'll have to figure out what you're going to do if you do want compression on those but at any rate um what those submasters also allow you to do is most consoles let you do some processing there you, it has an insert point which is either a jack or two jacks. Uh, even if it is a single jack, think of it as a send and a return. Or just dump it back into two extra channels on the board, uh, which is what we do a lot with our reverb. We'll, we'll send it out, but we'll bring the reverb volume back on a stereo set of uh, regular faders down on the board somewhere so we can control the amount of reverb or delay coming in. Because it's a Yamaha. Um, sorry, I got... Okay. Te- text message from the wife there. Hi, command. Checking in. She's having kind of a rough day. Um, 
So anyway, what this insert path allows you to do is think of it as a loop. You can send the signal from that group out to some sort of processing, whether it's an EQ, compressor, another effect. Although effects are, are less used on buses, uh, it is done. Vocals and reverb and delay are pretty common. Well, at least for well in the studio. Yeah. Um, live, it's a, it's, it locks you into some stuff that you don't necessarily want to be locked into. Okay. Um, do you really do that live? Uh, sometimes. Well, with vocals, I do, for sure. I'll, I'll send vocals to um, a different reverb if I can. Like, if I want a big room for the entire two mix, but I want a certain delay on the vocals, um, I'll send that separate. Which, for for certain parts of the song, again, when it comes down to something where maybe it's just a kick and snare, um, I'm trying to think of a song, I can't, I can't think of it, but uh, come on, feel the noise, really, I guess. It's like that, that big kick snare hit but you want maybe you want the vocals to to have a touch delay on them you can control that independently um, at least what I'm working on through a set of uh, return faders I guess is what they'll be called properly cool so uh, at any rate you have this chance to process the the most common thing you insert there is compression and mixing on a festival stage where you got band after band after band coming through or if you're mixing for a band where setup time is critical Really, what it lets you do is cheat. It's maybe not the optimal way to compress some things, but for example, if you have three vocalists in a band, you know, a lead vocalist and then two guys backing them up on the harmony parts, you want to compress that lead vocal some. Yeah. You know, you want to tame the, the the big screams and and you know raise up the, the quieter parts, which is what compression does. But uh, you know, let's say they're cranking out "Sweet Home Alabama," and if you haven't actually taken out a revolver and shot yourself in the head, because if it's a festival stage, you're bound to hear it at least twice. Uh, Mustang Sally, I actually saw a post. <laughs> I actually saw a post on a, an internet group about Mustang Sally being a sound guy's least favorite song. I can wholeheartedly agree. I'll tell mm-hmm. you that story sometime. Um, my lighting guy and I still cringe to this day. But um, what happens when you know on the on the verses? Your compressor might not be acting at all. Your your singer might be loud enough. He might not be getting so loud that he needs to be tamed down a little bit. You can leave that fader alone. If he goes a little hot, the compressor's going to tame him a little bit. So now you have two more guys start to sing. And if they're good singers, you don't really musically want things to get three times as loud in the vocal department right there. Cause then, you know, but electronically, they will. I mean, that's that's the problem that you're dealing with. Right. Is that they will get it, louder it, it, because you're you're adding three times as much essentially voltage, right? Yeah. To, to a circuit. Yep. And it, while it's it may not be uh, three times the apparent volume, um, that that is, you know, that can be a lot of extra decibels in your mix, and that can, you know, screw things around. So having a compressor on there, if it's barely acting when the lead singer's doing his thing, when the two other guys step up and start to sing, it the compressor doesn't totally squash it if you've set it right. But what it does is the mix get the vocals get a little bit louder. But a lot wider. Yeah, it starts squeezing it down, and, and things get really broad, which is you what can pan them really nice too. And right, right. If they're panned out. Yep. But, yeah, and if you're panning it, um, yeah, that'll it'll treat the two sides separately, almost. Yeah. Somewhat separately, um, or even if you even if it's just a mono group, um, it's a really nice effect. So, uh, and that's a great way to have compression on everything. Yeah. Um, you know, if you have an eight bus console and you got room, you could have a separate key group. You can have a separate percussion group. Uh, mm-hmm. You can burn, you know, a stereo pair for your toms and a mono one for your kick and snare. And yeah, you know, and, and one of the one of the big things that I I have issues with every week because I don't I don't mix every week. I I, I typically play um, in, in at the job that I work is that if you're routing a single instrument to its own subgroup, it's almost a waste of a subgroup. Like, um, unless you really want... Unless it's really to keep... If yeah. it's something that, that needs to go out to the monitor mixes unaffected by what you're doing for front of house. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're going to absolutely... Sc- I mean, it's cool. Like, you can... Compression as a tool is one thing. Compression as an effect is another. Yeah. So, like, if you're going to really slam a bass to just make it super fat, and it doesn't work with every bass player, and it doesn't work with every compressor, and, but if you're going to do that, yeah. and people need bass in their ears... Um, that's not necessarily what they want or need to be hearing. Yeah. Um, so I, I have done it. I'll, I'll burn up a, a group for a single instrument if that's what it takes. Um, or if you're set up, you know, if, if you have a, an acoustic guitar group on a festival stage, but you only have one acoustic guitar, then so be it. But at any rate, what, what putting your comps on your groups lets you do, which if you're a small fry starting out, you've got your, you know, 24 channel board with four groups. 
you don't have to invest in a ton of compressors. Like, I know a guy that has a 32-channel mix. He has a compressor. He has yeah. a channel of compression for every channel. Hardwired. And, and sometimes that helps. Like, it, it can help a lot more than not ha- Like, last week I had nothing at all. No compression at all. So my hand rid, rode, I'm sorry, <laughs> rode the subgroups all the time. Like, I like know getting that. Getting your hair did, getting your faders did. Get, yeah, get my faders did. <laughs> uh, like, I knew that on the course that four people were going to step up to a microphone, but I really only wanted to hear one of them cutting through everything, and, and the rest were flavor. So everything got pulled down, and maybe the lead vocalist on my left hand got pushed up just a touch so they would cut through. But you don't want, you don't want, especially if it's not the desired effect of the band, you don't want all four vocalists to drown out the entire rest of the mix and maybe hear a little bit of live snare. Maybe some kick drum. Yep. So I, I, I hope you're starting to get the, the usefulness of these, not just as sub-master faders, you know, to be able to control the, the group level of a set of faders, but also as a really useful point. So, like, as a shortcut, uh, you know, it's fantastic. I mean, I would love it if I had a rig where I had, a, a, had compression per channel, and that's one of the lures of digital audio. Oh, God, yeah. Um, is being able to do that, to... to take your time and really tailor each individual channel and, and make the dynamics perfect for each one but let's face it if you're on a stage and you have 13 bands to get on and off 20 minute sets 5 yeah. minute changeovers for right. a battle of the bands uh, you gotta move buddy. you don't have time <laughs> if you're lucky you've got a stage hand to help switch mics right Espe- yeah especially if you're there solo and you gotta <laughs> run back and forth to the stage oh. so what you can do is like alright kick yup it works snare yup it works toms boom 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 okay they work couple of crashes alright give me a beat for four bars boom cha boom boom cha digga 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 boom boom cha in that amount of time you can look over adjust your one drum group or your two <laughs> drum group compressors and you're good to go. Yep. Um, same thing too. Uh, the reason I like I'm on a uh, guitar is, I mean, a good guitar player doesn't need his rig compressed. He's his distortion is compressing his sound some. His gain stages are well managed, and he's not screaming loud on a clean channel and down low and dirty when it's gritty, and then solo when it's breaking the windows. A good guitar player will have all that stuff managed. If he doesn't, a compressor can help get that stuff under control. But what I really like is. I work a fat mic and a skinny mic on yep. every guitar channel when I'm out live, and and, uh, and swap verse chorus. Um, well, not swap. You can but I mean, you can play with them. You can do that, but yeah, like I can make a solo punch through the mix without making it louder. Like I tend to rely on the fat channel a little more. Yeah. Because um, guitar players tend to be shrill. I don't know why that's just a thing with them, but um, if they have a problem with them, they tend to be shrill sounding. So I'll put that fat mic up and then color it a little bit with a skinny mic. When it's solo time, if their solo level isn't hot enough, um, or if they specifically haven't set a solo level because their amp doesn't allow for it, or they just trust me, they're like, yeah, we don't boost for the solos, you guys know where they are, mix them. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't want to break people's spectacles, so I'll push the skinny mic up, basically swap it. You know, if, yeah. if, if the fat channel's at Unity and the skinny channel's down negative 10, put the fat channel at negative 10 and the skinny channel up to Unity. The guitar didn't get any louder in terms of actual decibels, but it's now it's cutting through the mix. It's yep. sitting on top without actually getting any louder. Um, and the other thing you can do in that, uh, by the way, the other thing about putting up two guitar mics is don't be afraid to use just one of them. Don't feel like because you have two, you have you to have use to them both. Use, right. um, every stage I mix on, if possible, I have two guitar mics, but I always check and see what they're like together. It, it doesn't happen a lot, but sometimes I just like one. I pick yep. one and go with it. And in the Absolutely. studio, I would probably not as much if ever go with two mics two close mics i might go with a room mic and a close mic but i, I feel like you ought to be able to capture yeah. what you need to capture with a single mic I, I do particularly if i if i can i do three i'll do two right up like what i what i'm liking so far um since i don't have all the the channel strips that i like right now i'll run a 57 uh slanted about i almost 45 degree angles probably probably 30 degrees uh, 609 right on the cab right next to it so I don't have to worry about any delay compensation and then a, uh, a large diaphragm condenser a bit back and for solo stuff like you know studio tracking is different you, you've got your chance to track everything and then go back and redo a solo take but um, what's nice what I've found is for solo stuff like I'll pull the 57 back a bit and push the 609 and then kind of crank the large diaphragm condenser to get all the high end but still get some meat out of it Yep. and not muddy everything else up. 
Yep. And I like what he said, too, about, you know, you can do one mic on the verse and another one on the chorus. That's a great way of, like, nothing changed. The guitar is the same apparent volume. The guitar player doesn't have to think about it, but you've crafted something into that music that makes the verse different from the chorus. Or maybe you have them, maybe you use one mic on the first verse and then both of them for the chorus and then the other mic for the second verse if it's going yeah. in a different place. Add some you music can, to it. It's not, mixing sound is absolutely an art and... And that might not be something that anybody would ever be able to notice and put their finger on it, but it, it, that's what separates the men right. from the boys. Yeah, um, no, knowing that you can mess around with Right, and stuff. a well-crafted song on a record, you listen to it, and a song that you know, even without being able to put your finger on it, like somebody turns on a you know a Metallica song or something, yep. I can tell you what verse they're going into. You, you play me two measures of a Metallica song, I can tell you exactly where it is, because even though it's the same, <laughs> it's different. Right. Every, every time they go through it, it, it builds there's, or it pulls back or something changes. Right, and there's there's a lot of, like, what, what I love is, like, I don't know who the engineer is on the, on the Slash records, but um, the last couple of years Slash put out some records, and you can tell, like, yeah, he's got, a, he's got a ribbon mic on here and a 57, and then when it cuts to the solo part, like, yeah, there's still, the guitars are still fat and they're still cutting through and you can still distinguish everything, but maybe he just, maybe he just goes to 57 on the chorus, like, it's... It's not necessarily dead center, but that solo mic, whatever he's using for the actual guitar solos, pushes through. Whether it's EQ and post or whatever, but it it comes through different. Yep. So getting back to compression on the groups, um, yeah, this, is, this is one of my favorite, favorite things about compressing on the groups and why I mentioned guitars specifically is, um, you know, in a bar band where there's one guitar player... Uh, that thing really becomes about the most important thing there is. I mean, yeah, you know, the, the kick drum and the and the bass are working together, rocking the beat, the snare's rocking the backbeat, the singer hopefully is playing, you know, sort of everything's equally important, but the thing that you have the most control over is the sound guy, is that guitar sound. Yep. And, man, if you got a guitar player that's got his stuff dialed in, I mean, I've, I've had some awesome nights just mixing tiny bands and tiny bars, but I don't know if the wind just went straight into the mic on this thing or what, but um, if you can still hear me, <laughs> over the roar of the wind and the epic crickets and cicadas that we have this summer. Yeah. Um, I'll spend the whole night. You know, I got the kit dialed in, my compression set, bass player's in a nice groove, he doesn't need touching, singer's holding on tight, and the compressor's keeping an eye on him. I'll have my left two, first two fingers on those two guitar channels and my right index finger on the guitar group. And if my compressor's dialed in right, I can shove both of those mics up. The compressor brings the apparent level down but the sound just got really fat. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's a change that the guitar player didn't have to do, but, like, I know the material these guys are playing, and it's guitar rock, so, I mean, it's it's really the sole instrument of the yep. thing. So, like, you know, if he's coming off a Tom Petty song where I've been rocking the, the skinny mic, the 57, uh, to get that kind of lonesome sound. Trippy almost. And then they go into Van Halen. Like, it's got to be big brass balls guitars oh, yeah. from front to back. So I'll slam those two the two faders up, and maybe I'll back the group off a hair if the compressor doesn't bring it down enough. But without making it louder, I just put that guitar even more front and center, and people respond to it. You know, like the, everybody's chilling out, relaxing, listening to the last dance from Mary Jane, and yeah. then you know, the opening line from "Running with the Devil" comes out of the bass, <laughs> and man, that first guitar hit, bam! Like you look back to see if there's still glass in the pinball machine. <laughs> I learned. I learned. Uh, sat down and messed around with. Someone give me a doctor just for you, John. Yeah. Let's go. Cool. Keep going. We got time. All right. <laughs> but no, I did. Like after after I saw the concert, I was like, "Wow, that didn't translate very well." I was like, "Well, John likes the song, so I should probably learn it just just to have it." The next time I sound check somebody's stuff for me, like that'll that'll give me the juice that I'm looking for. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I had uh, I have one guitar player and one drummer that when they wind up on the same stage together, invariably play. Uh, a Led Zeppelin tune together. Mm. It's totally unrelated, but what was it? They did it to a, a worship song. Uh, I had the the lead singer who was playing acoustic guitar. I was checking just his voice against his instrument for his ears, and the guitar player and the I got it. The guitar player and the drummer started playing "Fool in the Rain." I mean, and this is a straight white bread worship song. So he's, I mean, hmm, white man clap on one and three. It was like that, and the drummer and the guitar player started playing. Fool in the rain, with like with extra reggae flavor over top of it, and I like I had to stop working. I was laughing so hard. Physical graffiti was so nice. I don't know if I don't think it's on physical graffiti, but it like the 
Yeah, go back and listen to just the change in, in musical feel in between four or Sozo, Zozo, and uh, Physical Graffiti and Houses of the Holy. Just their approach changed. I don't know if they started smoking weed instead of doing LSD and, and coke, but <laughs> just, it's a little more. You get into it a little bit more. So anyway, we're we're coming up on the the time mark here. What do we got? It's it's not quite the longest show we've ever done. It's actually in a pretty good range. So we're gonna babble for just a couple more minutes. Uh, if any last minute ideas come to us, we'll lay them on you. But um, this really turned into the mixing musically show, yeah. and specifically how to do it by throwing compressors on your groups. I hope we explain that well enough for you to grasp it. Um, if you're new to mixing, if you're just expanding, getting to that point, or if you're frustrated with wanting better dynamic control, but you don't want to buy a compressor for every channel, and, and by the way, like you, you really need some chops to do that. Yeah, um, it hurts. The you, you, you get your fingers stretching in real good that way. Yep, and and you gotta you gotta do that airline thing where you you sweep all of the dials with your eyes and, and make sure everything is right. Um, but uh. Let me see. What do we leave off? I, I, I hope this encourages you. If you're not compressing on your groups right now, give it a try. Um, do it a little bit. See if you like it. Because yeah, for you, one, it's speedy. I mean, yeah. you know, if you're working for the same band, playing the same set all the time, and and you've dialed in and identified those spots that really need compression, then this isn't the thing for you. But if you're a, a small mobile sound guy and you just need to make life easier on yourself, uh, one channel of compression per subgroup maybe one or two extras for those problem children and you're good to go like i uh it makes things easier on you know if you have a comp that has a gate on it too uh if you're if you're good with it you can gate all your toms at once and that's super handy yeah the studio as well yeah it saves a lot of cpu in the long run i like with with me sending kick snare as a group and then um toms as a group like i i don't have to waste the cpu on each individual tom i can set it as a group and know if I've got a drummer that's good enough that can hit toms appropriately, doesn't just beat the living piss out of the floor tom, but knows what the response is of each individual instrument. Mm -hmm. um, you can set a nice little, you get a little bit of bleed because you don't want it to totally fade in and out um, and sound like there's a gate on it, but it helps a lot. Yep. Now, the other thing, this is, the, I think, the last thing I'm going to say about bus compression is it lets you do, and we've talked about this before, what's called a, a smash channel. Yeah. And uh, with this, it's the other term, the proper term for it is parallel compression. Let's say uh, you've got a vocalist who's, uh, even if they're not, it could work, but uh, you got a vocalist that's real consistent. Um, you throw that vocal group that he's on or she is on and just smash it. I mean, yep. get, get a hold of the ratio and the, and the threshold knobs Crank and just sucker up. keep some red lights on all the time and all the red lights on some of the time if possible. Just make that sucker work. But you paid money for it, didn't you? What you have to do, is, uh, yeah, just make it cry. But what you have to do is, while that singer's channel is routed to that group to get the ever loving snot squeezed out of it, you have to also route them around that group and hit the left right button too, so that their signal's going unaltered straight to the main mix. And now both of those faders are going to have to ride down a little bit, probably about six or twelve, six dB total. Yeah. Look, so bring them both down three as a start, and maybe more depending on what you're using for makeup gain, a few other factors. But uh, figure it out. Just know that they have to come down some to keep the singer sitting in the right spot in the mix. But then what you can do is, just like I did with that guitar, except you can, well, the guitar thing you can do song, you know, note by note if you want to. Yeah. But um, instead of your fingers move that driving back. that source into the compression. You've got it there all the time. It's, yeah, it's sort of another way to do it, <clears throat> but you don't have to be as careful. Like to do the guitar trick that I described earlier, you got to really have your guitar bus compression just right. It's got to be just so for that trick to really work well and not be like, oh, he, eh. obnoxious. Yeah, not be obvious. Um, but with a smash channel, what you've got, and you can do this works great with drums too. You get the attack, you get those transients, and those are the exciting things, the the T's and the S's. Like if you compress a vocal heavily. And it looks like a sausage on the on the wave display on, in Pro Tools. Um, that's not an exciting vocal. There's there's no peaks and valleys into it. There's nothing for you to fall into. There's no mountain for you to climb. It makes it a pop song instead of a rock song. Yeah. Um, so you can let those transients go through a little bit, and that. But then when you want it, you can. So you, you can take the the smash completely out and have a really thin vocal, which 
you know, if it's a girl singing, uh, I don't know, I'm trying to think, uh, something haunting and high. A heart song. Right. So if you're, uh, you might <laughs> you're wanna, singing alone, you might want a lot. Yeah, you might want a lot of compression on that though too. <laughs> but uh, let's say they're doing, uh, oh, like the cranberries. What's that? Uh, they did a real delicate number. I'm having yeah. a hard time coming up with examples, but something you know, sort of ethereal and and floaty, or like a Bjork song or something like that. Uh, let it go through uncompressed. Let it let it float in and out of the mix. Then they go to that heart song. Yeah. Bring your main, bring your your initial vocal channel down. Bring that fat channel in there, that smash channel, and all of a sudden that vocal is a ten ton truck yep. barreling through there. Same thing for drums. Um, if you compress drums too much, they get really fat and really, really good sounding, like really meaty. But, but it's like that an entire show. What like where there's no dynamics that you're allowing to process through your system. Right. Or maybe you want it. I mean, maybe it's a dance band. Maybe it's a party yeah. band and you, and you want that real fat drum sound like, you know, big tom fills. And and really fat driving kick, but you also don't want to miss the crack of the snare and and some of that stuff peeking over the top. Send your drums straight to the main mix uncompressed. Send them to a pair, a group or groups, however you're going to do it, whatever you're blessed with. Smash them. And then work the two back and forth against each other. You might find a sweet spot and leave it if the band's playing the same kind of material all night. But like working for cover bands, you know they'll do Tom Petty one minute and Rage Against the Machine the next. Um, yep. It just it gives you a really wide palette to work with. It's a really worthwhile tactic. Builds build your chops a lot mm -hmm. for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's cool about it is once you get so that you understand it and can do it. You know, I call it the video game effect. You just you do or like driving. You do it without thinking about it. You know, right. if, you, if you've only ever driven an automatic and you're hopping in a stick for the first time, you might have to look at that thing, oh, at yeah. that stick every time you do it. Like look at your left foot, make it press the clutch. You know, after two days of that, you're doing it without thinking. You're talking on your cell phone. You're putting on makeup. You're drinking coffee, whatever. Um, it gets like that. It gets so that your hands are on the controller. The system is a part of you. You're hearing that guitar, and you're, it's not even a thought. Like, it doesn't even make it to the part of your brain that turns that thought into words of English in your brain. Yeah. You know, like, that, that Tom Petty song ends, that Van Halen song starts, and your fingers just do what it takes to make that fat guitar sound happen. Or it goes the other way, and you take it back. Or, you know, you, you feel a song building, and you, you know, you react to it. And you might, you might not react to it the same way. You might, you might, do so, you might even do something that's counterintuitive. Um, that, that can but really it, throw an audience for a yeah. loop too, but that makes it exciting. And that makes you, uh, you know, I, I had this argument with people, and I, I really feel like I'm right. Um, guys that say, you know, oh, mixing is just technical, you know, it's not an art. <laughs> Bull. <laughs> it's, That's it's, your instrument. It's absolutely an art. And I'm, you know, think of it as, as being more of a curator, you know, that, that we present what the band presents. Um, think of it in terms of curation. You know, you can take the Mona Lisa and hang it on a white wall, put a spotlight on it, velvet rope around it, and you're done. Or you can put it in a room where the wall treatment is the same as, you know, the the villa in wherever the you know Michelangelo painted that thing, and 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 light it so that it feels like daylight in the south of France or Italy or whatever. I'm, I'm totally getting this wrong. And I was an art history major, <laughs> um, minor art history minor. Yeah, there you go. Um, you see what I'm saying though? Like you can you can take a beautiful work of art and improve it by putting putting it in an, in an environment that accentuates it, that takes you there, that somehow gets you into the, the thought process of what the artist was doing. Um, another, and another thing too is if the musical support it, um, you know, there's this this beautiful ugly effect where like you know maybe you want it to sound a little bit more grungy to and and do that either as an effect but or to offset and make something else sound really beautiful like i call it like the the beauty and the beast effect i mean there's, there's a lot of Drew. sound garden stuff like that like oh yeah you want the guitars to sound like black hole sun is you want the guitars to sound pretty and chime through just that touch of course on them but maybe you want chris cornell to sound like a demon right and, and more most, th most time he does and i, I love yeah. chris cornell but Sometimes you want his voice to sound so dark to accentuate or bring out the the beautifulness, uh, the beauty of the music itself. Like the music's really pretty, but your vocalist or maybe your guitarist or whatever instrument is accentuating it sounds really dirty, and it just oh my gosh, it brings out something in the song. Uh, it, it's a really nice effect to work with for that kind of stuff, and whatever band you're working with, maybe they've got a song like that where 
the music is really pretty, but you want that nine inch nails is like that a lot. The music will sound great, but Trent Reznor really wants his voice to come through like he's got something real dark and deep to say, and yep. he usually does. But uh, to go back to what I was calling the Beauty and the Beast effects, I mean, Drew Carey's ugly, no question. J Lo is beautiful, <laughs> no question. You put Drew Carey next to J Lo, and it accentuates his ugliness and her beauty, and a lot of the bottom end. And that's that. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's a whole lot of bottom end in that metaphor. <laughs> mm. Um, <laughs> mm, bottom end and a white guy. <laughs> but uh, you know, think about that. Like uh, like Bjork's a good example. Like listen to some of the dirty, nasty synthetic sounds that she puts on her stuff, and it makes her voice that much more beautiful and ethereal. Yeah. Um, I don't even like Bjork, but yeah. Yeah, she actually does that really well. Yep. So that's that's another method of mixing musically. Like, you know, take that China boy and, and accentuate it. Make it extra, make it just sound like an absolute trash can lid. Yeah. Um, and then when he goes back to, you know, in the next song when he gets on his ride cymbal and he's just tickling it and it sounds like rain on a on a rooftop. Make it sound like that, not not like a car accident <laughs> on the freeway. Yep. And you know, uh, you can do it with the vocals. You can do it with the guitars. Uh, you know. Making one thing in a, in a mix sound really trashy makes the pretty stuff sound even prettier. Oh, yeah. So anyway, we've run pretty long, and uh, my wife's on the phone getting information for me, so I'm going to wrap it up, answer her questions, and get back to the Olympics. And uh, just as a last note, what's been bugging me the whole show, not bugging me, but oh boy, I've wanted to say, at least, um, <laughs> it's something that, that Carl, uh, who who's an awesome engineer, told my wife when he kind of let her mix vocals for a while. Um she's as a vocalist has an unbelievable sense of how to mix group vocals single vocals like she she's a person that doesn't know the technical end of it but she knows what sounds good um and this relates to this and every other podcast or blog post that we've written is that you're sitting at a console um and what he said was sound comes in and sound goes out and you need to make sure it doesn't sound bad anywhere in between um and that like Going in and, and really thinking about that every time I mix a show, um, you you're the variable in the mix. Like, yeah, you've got different gear and stuff, but you're the most controllable variable, and you really need to make sure that you know what you're doing and give it a hell of an effort every single time you get up there. Because otherwise, you somewhat the band or the group can find somebody else to do it for you. Yeah, yeah. To go back on, I kind of wandered away from that argument. You know, like I don't. I don't think of myself as a member of a band, like even a band that I've worked with a lot and I, I feel like I know the guys really well. I don't ever elevate myself to like that fifth Beatle status because I, oh, I feel like at that yeah. point I'd have kind of a swollen head. But I'm definitely a partner, maybe not Absolutely. a 50-50 partner. You know, I'm, I'm a <laughs> silent partner is a weird term for a sound guy. But yeah, like, <laughs> you know, if I do my job well, I've collaborated it with them. And whether it's through, you know, repeated working with somebody and having conversations and, and, actively working stuff out or just you know meeting a band introducing them myself to them and you know in a five minute changeover getting them on stage and then really quick trying to get inside their heads and, and figure out where they're at and what they're doing and then do everything in my power that i can to accentuate what they're doing and to keep the out of control parts under control if they need to be if we're if i'm deciding to go that way yep. or you know making it more out of control if that's where they're going um you know i'm not trying to clean up everything if it's if it's uh, if it's supposed to be dirty, like if they're making dirt and slinging mud, then I'm gonna help them mix mud pies. And if they're, what are you doing? My laptop um, totally die. Oh, okay. No. Oh, congratulations! Oh. This is officially the longest podcast <laughs> we've ever done. <laughs> so much for quick last ideas. Light another one. Okay. Well, anyway, um, I'm gonna quit babbling now. But I, I feel like we could pick up here and, and easily do a whole other podcast on this. Uh, maybe next time we got some more guys to to chime in and. and offset our views maybe oh that's fine because i oh, yeah. i constantly have to restrain myself so i don't walk on other people's ideas and and anthony frequently has longer ideas that he wants to get out that we either don't let him or <laughs> <laughs> or i shouldn't time doesn't allow so yeah it's a good chance to kind of breathe and let some of those longer ideas go out so anyway we hope that helped uh this really did turn out to be more of a, a musicality and mixing podcast and actually uh unless something better comes along we might pick up right where we left off and and flog this horse again because absolutely um it it it, it does it takes more than an hour to really get your grasp on something like this. oh lord yeah <laughs> 20 years I mean, yeah i'm still getting it <laughs> i feel like i'm only just starting to get it the more i learn the more i realize i need to learn uh actually i need to give a quick shout out i i mentioned him not by name before but i wanted to say hi to my my favorite intern evan stoddard hardest working man in church showbiz 
in church business, I guess. That doesn't get paid. That doesn't get paid. <laughs> Sorry, dude. But, uh, what was, shoot, I forgot what he said that I was going to quote him as saying. What were we just talking about? Bus compression. <laughs> and about how, uh, oh, I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah, he was like, I, was, I kept mentioning compression talking to him tonight. He's like, everything's always about compression with you. I'm like, well... Yes. <laughs> well done, young Skywalker. <laughs> you've you've picked up. The force is strong in that one. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's it's all about dynamics. So before we get going down that slippery slope again and, and run out of Olympics to watch, <laughs> I know it's getting late. Um, all right, we're gold medal stuff. We're gonna wrap it there. So thanks for tuning in. Please continue to send us your ideas because they turn into podcasts like this when you do. Um, and maybe, maybe we'll get to the topic sometime. Also, and maybe especially uh, if you hear us uh, saying something foolish or incorrect, or maybe uh, your way of thinking wanders down a different pathway from ours, or you, you think of something that we didn't, by all means, uh, please, your con- contact, your comments, that's the word I was looking for, your comments are always welcome, much appreciated. We're glad to have them, glad to hear what you're thinking, glad to have your extra ideas. Those, uh, those steer us along our course. Let us know we got Wi-Fi, we can try and Skype you in if, if time zones permit. And I can get my, I've never successfully connected any of my machines to your Wi-Fi. Yeah, we'll do it at the church. There you go. <laughs> so yeah, we also, we, uh, we have been short on guests, we love to have people, people on as guests, that's definitely a fun thing to do to expand our horizons. So, uh, we'll be wrapping it up here, I think uh, I can't see the... Good Lord, this might not even fit on the server. Okay. <laughs> Two parts. <laughs> Lord. Yeah, we're just, that means just incredibly, incredibly low bit rate. So, all right. Uh, we'll say goodnight there and uh, leave you off until next week. Thanks for stopping in. We This has been the uh, Smart to Noise Radio... We post stuff on Facebook. We do the doctor audio <laughs> talking stuff. Thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you later. This has been the Smart to Noise Radio Ratio Radio. Smart to Noise Ratio Radio. Thank you. Good night.